Welcome to Backstage Pass with Gail Davis, your invitation into the world of keynote speaking and event planning expertise. Join us as we pull back the curtain and dive into exclusive interviews with speaking industry experts. From seasoned speakers to master event planners, we're here to provide you with the ultimate backstage experience. Get ready to unlock valuable insights, tips, and strategies that will elevate your events and leave your audience inspired. Welcome to Backstage Pass. Today, we are joined by a very special guest who GDA Speakers has booked 33 times. And that's a pretty impressive number when you consider that Tim is not a full-time speaker. He's always got a full-time gig going on and speaks in addition. Uh, Currently, he's the Vice President of Customer Insights with Upwork. Previously, he was the Chief Solutions Officer at Yahoo!, He's a New York Times bestselling author with five books, and he was a five-year member of the Global Institute for Leadership Development. The Financial Times referred to his innovation and collaboration insights as a force multiplier. And we've got some news we're going to be sharing with you today, which involves Harvard Business University. But first, I just want to pause and say welcome, and I'm so glad you're here, Tim. So good to be with you, Gail. So good to see you again. It's funny, Tim and I um, were living practically next door to each other, and we ran into each other in the grocery store. And I don't know if you, I don't know if you know this, Tim, but in many ways, you really sealed the deal and inspired us to bring back the GDA podcast. It was on pause after COVID, and our team wanted to refresh this and make it something more current. And when I ran into you in the grocery store, you started telling me this cool news about Harvard. And I came running back to the office and updated the team. And they said, that's it. Let's go with backstage pass. Let's always try to bring new, you know, relevant information that maybe others aren't talking about in our space. So very appropriate that we have you here today and i would love for you to start with the grocery store update which is all about you ai in the harvard business school take it away thank you very much um for several years i've uh, been talking to some of the professors at harvard business school about advances in artificial intelligence um, I even interviewed uh, Dr. Kareem Lakani, uh, who uh, heads up their innovation at HBS, uh, just for a program two years ago. And um, this February, they extended me an executive fellowship to serve the Digital Data Design Institute at Harvard. This is the AI Research Institute. They've got 12 labs in five countries. Their charter is to democratize digital transformation and AI for business people just like you and I. And my role there, Gail, is to help package academic research, ones and zeros, into business insights that are actionable. Now, you've known me for over 20 years. And, over 20 years. Right? So my, uh, my, my cadre of fellow speakers, whether it's me or, or somebody like Peter Sheehan, who I know you work with you know, quite a bit, Ryan Estes, young Ryan Estes, that's something <laughs> that we've all learned to do over the decades, is to take research and make the numbers count in terms of, okay, as a business leader, how do I apply that to winning? How do I apply that to whatever my, my du jour priority is, growing the top line of a business, for example, or digital transformation as an initiative. So I'll be doing that with Harvard Business School this year and really focusing on how does artificial intelligence move the needle for businesses and help them grow? And then how do we think of all the surrounding issues past the wonder of futurism, which I think last year we were all completely laser focused on? So true. I feel like Every event planner has heard the buzzword AI and they're all asking for it. But then when we ask the follow-up question, what part of AI do you want to hear about? A lot of them don't really know. Is it gen AI? Is it how to prepare for AI? Is it practical? So your unique 
area is going to be the application to business scenarios. That's is, right. is that it? No. That's right. It's uh, I, I really think a lot these days, Gail, about what I call return on AI. Oh, I love that. I talk to chief financial officers in my role at Upwork. I talk to them all the time. I probably spend 25% of my life talking to the chief financial officer who these days should be referred to as the chief brutality officer, right? They want to know where's the return because their CEOs, their team members are pounding the table, Gail, saying, we've got to have AI. We know it's important. There's reasons why we could get to that in a minute. But, but as the pressure for companies to invest in artificial intelligence increases, so does the need for business literacy around artificial intelligence. So, you know, over a year ago, I made a commitment that I'm going to go talk to everybody in the world about this. We're going to figure out a, a lot of areas uh, for organizations to get better at AI. So now I talk about de-risking AI investments. AI literacy for the C-suite with the good news, Gail, you don't need to learn all the technology. You just need to learn how to frame your regular business challenges as either being AI addressable or not AI addressable. And then I also just think about this idea of like, what are the hidden costs behind AI implementation and what metrics can we connect it to that we're already comfortable with so that if it really works, Gail, we can dial this thing up to 10 and win our market. I love it. I love it. You know, we have a lot of event planners that that listen, and I'm thinking through various audiences, and I'm wondering where you think it's the best fit. Is it a conference like a officers, a global officers conference where that you have the top C-suite of a company? Is it the sales kickoff? Um, is it lower level management? Is it all of the above? I mean, where do you see this message landing ideally? Yeah, yeah. this is a leadership topic. Okay. Typically, I get brought in to speak to business offsites. They might be like a director plus kind of meetings. Um, okay. Very frequently, I'm brought in by private equity firms to speak to a portfolio company's leadership team. So they okay. might be getting together 50, 60, 70 of their leaders in an offsite. And that's a typical engagement for me. I also speak at trade association events where last year their theme was AI, but they brought in a futurist. And the futurist talked about practical applications like you could use Gen AI to do this or you could use machine learning to do that. And they kind of give you a glimpse into the future of AI five, 10 years from now. They want to follow up with something now to make that become a business lever instead of a technology innovation. And that's a great follow-up for me. So I found this year, typically I'm brought in to follow last year's futurist to really put a business lens to it now. Like, okay, how do we operationalize it? How do we know when it's working? How do we take the risk out of it? And most importantly, how do we treat it like every other innovation we've treated in our life, except this time, with a sense of urgency on scale. Why is urgency so important? Well, because we've had a lot of innovations in technology. I mean, I've, I've seen them, you know, in my, don't want to date myself here, but. <laughs> That's okay. In, in my 40 <laughs> years of being in business, my 40 years, I, I believe I've seen it all, right? So my first job out of college was a personal attache, that stands for executive assistant, uh, to Dr. Edward Deming. When he came back from Japan, he was one of the leaders of the quality movement when they introduced statistics and manufacturing. That was a huge leap into digital, in a, a digital transformation. And for those of you old enough to know about the quality story, if, if you didn't get it and the Japanese did, they're going to put you out of business. And that was a huge thing that was going on in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. So I've seen it all, right? I was with Mark Cuban at the dawn of WW1. I saw the rise of cloud computing. Gail, this one's different. There's two types of technical innovations, okay? There's incremental and there's exponential Think of incrementals 10 to 30%. Think of exponential as 3x to 10x in terms of performance. We haven't seen a 3x to 10x performance driver in tech in our lives. The closest thing I've ever seen that was 3x to 10x was Six Sigma back during the quality movement. But none of the other technologies 
have really been as impactful, meaning you could go from zero to 100 with artificial intelligence, as we've seen now, especially with generative AI maturing and natural language processing becoming the way that we interact with data. So this is a big change. And because it's a big change, your competitors have an opportunity to make incredible gains very, very quickly. So it's really incumbent on you to figure out where your sweet spot is, measure success, and turn up the adoption rate much higher than you've thought about things that you've tested in the past. How much um, research is required on your part when you go in to speak to the C-suite? Is, is the message the same regardless of industry, or do you have to customize a bit to understand where they're at with all this growth? It's a good question. It's a good question. Now, every time I give a speech, I want to have prep calls so we can tailor the talk to the situation at hand because every business is different. McKinsey did some research last year I thought was amazing. And what they were measuring is where can a company get revenue impact and where is it going to cost them a lot of money? And what you can see here is you can get maximum revenue impact with minimum investment around sales and marketing applications of generative AI. You can get a lot of value on software engineering and customer support, but it costs you a lot more money up front to invest in. These are important discussions to have with the meeting uh, stakeholders before I come out and talk because we can identify where's the opportunity for your company. We also want to know, what have you been trying? Where's the energy right now inside the company? Is it towards machine learning? Is it towards generative AI? What is the digital mindset of your competition? These are all really important questions because what I want to come in and do is give everyone a way to treat AI like a lever that you pull, but you pull it intentionally and you pull it in a way that's measurable. But to do that, I want to get the context. I found, Gail, that our prep calls with clients previous to this talk on AI have been as valuable to the leaders on the, you know, in, in the process <laughs> as the actual keynote presentation. Because the thing I do in my business life is I travel around the world sitting down with C-suites behind closed doors and helping them write artificial intelligence go-to-market plans. So as I prepare for a speech, I bring a lot of that advice in the preparation to those conversations as I customize the talk. This is great. I think it really paints a picture of how you approach it and what the content can be expected. Um, yep. You know, GDA is... 25 years old this year, and I've known you the entire time, and you are constantly reinventing yourself, Tim. I mean, I remember Love is the Killer app and uh, the likability factor. What are you listening to? What are you reading? How do you stay so on top of the next thing? I'm, I'm really curious about that. I'm a voracious reader. You, you've known me for a long time. 50 books a year is not unusual uh, as a pace for me. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you can see in my collection here, um, I, I'm, uh, you know, you see these, but this is Prediction Machines, Power Prediction, Competing in the Age of AI that are behind me. These are my three favorite books on AI in the world. I'm always asking people, what are you reading? I'm sampling things. I don't always buy the book and read it all the way through. I do focus more on books than white papers. Um, I'm listening to a couple of podcasts, so I love the Harvard Business Review podcast on AI. I love the Professor G show, Professor Scott Galloway. He is a hoot. I, I listen to him <laughs> all the time. Um, I follow the work of um, Ethan Mollick. He's a professor at Wharton. He studies AI. He just released an amazing book called Co-Intelligence, and I'm absorbing research from Harvard Business School's, you know, AI Institute, I'm absorbing uh, at least 25 incremental pieces of research every week. Now, you might ask, how do you absorb 25, like, <laughs> studies a week? So I don't just talk about AI. I use artificial intelligence every single day of my life. So I use ChatGPT 4.0 extensively. In fact, Gail, you can create your own custom GPT. So I have a GPT called TLDR that stands for too long, didn't read. And what I did is I trained that GPT 
on how I annotate and make notes on articles around AI. Like, what do I actually care about? So I took about 70 studies that I had read over the last year and highlighted, you know, in, in, in PDF format and then made notes to call out, remember this, this is important to the talk, et cetera. And when I fed all those documents in one large document, to this GPT and said, this is what I care about for AI studies. And then I fed it additionally, the context of my focus is return on investment, taking the risk out, focusing on the disruptive economics of AI, helping business people reframe challenges as prediction problems. So now, now when I put a study in, in seconds, it reads it as if it was me, tells me the six to seven points I should be highlighting and connects the dots on previous studies. And it does it immediately. I could probably absorb a hundred studies a week using that GPT with respect to continuing to compile more and more insights. And obviously, Gail, when it, something comes along that's meaty, I'm going to go back and read it word for word so that I can understand the context of everything being highlighted, just like I did before I had it. What a great use of the technology. I love that. It's very exciting. Uh, well, I, I feel like I have a good understanding of what you're talking about now. I'm excited to share this with our listeners. Um, title of the podcast is Backstage Pass. So I always like to ask, you know, a couple of things to give us a glimpse of what's behind the curtain. And I'm curious, other than your research and your calls, do you have any kind of a backstage ritual before you go on stage in front of an audience? You know, I do. Um, first you of all, do? I like to show up. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do. It, it's, it's what I call the long engagement. So I show up obviously the day before, right? So I show up, if there's a reception, I go to it. I get very involved in talking to people about their challenges, how they think about artificial intelligence, what they've got in flight, maybe their fears about it, how they thought about cloud 10 years ago, how they thought about you know the birth of the World Wide Web if they're my age, et cetera. It starts the night before. Uh, it continues during breakfast. I get to the point, Gail, where I like to stand back and look at my audience as they walk into the room. Because one of the things I've learned from my coach, our common friend, Nick Morgan, is that every audience, they walk into a room and they need something. It's like any good storyteller says, every character has a need, a motivation, a place they walk into a room and they, they want to, to, to move from A to B. And I try to really understand that both in the prep calls, but just visually, you're gonna watch people walk into a room and say, I feel cloudy when I walk out of the room, I wanna feel clear about things. I feel optimistic when I walk out of the room, I wanna feel pragmatic about my optimism. You can see it if you'll watch the room a little bit. So that's a ritual of mine. And um, I always say before I go out on stage, the only reason to give a speech is to change the world. In fact, that's what I say before I do any of things, including a podcast, right? Before I got on today, um, one of the things I, I told myself is, it's not so much that you remember everything you're gonna say, it's critical to know the thing that you cannot forget to say, right? And so, for example, today, as I got ready for this, I said to myself, make sure and talk about how business people can learn to reframe a regular old business problem like low conversion rates for sales into a prediction problem. What I mean by that, Gail, is AI, we've made it really complicated, but it's really, really simple. Artificial intelligence is a prediction machine. It takes information that you have, produces information that you don't have. And when you can look at your business through that lens and say, the reason our sales isn't converting, the reason our customers aren't buying, the reason I can't hire enough people, all of that is a prediction problem that artificial intelligence can address when you begin to see business through that lens, you can become incredibly disruptive when it comes to business growth. I want to make sure I got that right. It is a prediction machine mm -hmm. that takes information you already have. That's right. And turns it into information you don't have. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Let me give you a really simple, oh, simple way to think about this. Um, used to be in the United Kingdom, 
we would talk about a taxi company as being a logistics problem, right? I got to have cars. I got to have drivers. And when you looked at the pre-Uber economy in the United Kingdom, they always had a shortage of drivers, probably 40,000 drivers. Why was that the case, Gil? Because it was a logistics problem. They had to have financing for cars. And every London cab driver had to go to school for about three years. It was called the knowledge. So they could learn the complicated routes around London. And then Google Maps and Waze applied artificial intelligence. What did it do? It created a prediction solution so that anybody who had a car and a phone could be an Uber driver. And we went from 40,000 drivers to over a quarter million drivers in just a few years. And now mobility is everywhere. Why? Because the whole concept of driving became a prediction problem, not a logistics problem. And as I work with businesses, whether they say, oh, our wholesalers take six months to get up and running, that becomes a prediction problem, predicting every little thing they need to do to move through all the steps. When someone says to me, our sales team, their conversion rate to get meetings with our account executives, it's dismally low. We need to hire new salespeople. I say, no, you don't. You need prediction technology to find the greatest hits of sales cadences that dramatically change your conversion rate. I've seen this have an exponential effect on sales and rewire someone that always said, oh, if sales are bad, we hire new people, we bring in new consultants and we start testing new products. I say, no, you don't. You go back to the data and you put a prediction machine on it. You take its insights and you scale them. That's just a paradigm shift for organizations. And many of which I've worked with over the last couple of years that can be in industries like service and manufacturing have found an incredible blue ocean against their competitors by having that mental change in how they see everything. You know, when I sit down with businesses, that's what you have to do is you have to start with a business challenge that is hurting their bottom line and continue to use the old five whys till you get to the root cause. And I'm telling you, Gail, 80% of the time, the root cause is something that's about data and prediction and better insights. And every single time that becomes an AI addressable issue. And then that's where they go start looking for a technology solution. The reason this is a paradigm shift is most businesses are applying AI based on which tools they like or which tools their tech team say those tools work for us. That is not how you do it. Artificial intelligence should start in the business based on business problems. You can go find the solutions later. They're ubiquitous. That's the paradigm shift. I always promote with businesses. And I think that's going to make the difference between good and great in companies over the course of the next few years. I love that. You know, when you were talking about your intentionality before you get on stage or before you get on a podcast that you want to make a difference, what is one or some of the meaningful feedback that you've gotten from audiences after you've presented? The most meaningful feedback I ever get after I present is they say, we heard your advice, we started using it immediately, and it's produced business results. I remember JK, he hired me to come speak to his sales team several years ago. I came in and talked about collaboration and how they can use it between sales and marketing. And Gail, when he wrote back to me, he said, we put it to use. Our sales increased by X percent. Our profits increased by Y percent. The only thing we did different was bring you in. That thrills me because I've always, as a person on the other side, I've always wanted speakers to come in and be prescriptive from a place of expertise and be highly specific about what I need to do and put me to work. Um, yes, they need to be entertaining. I always open with a story. You know me, Gail. It's always about putting the audience in a frame of mind. But at the end of the day, I measure the impact I make based on measurable things that they actually put to work. You know, that's why as I was looking at this before the call, because we've done a lot with you, Gail, we've done 33 with you, okay? Half of them, half of them or more were repeat business, right? The only reason you get brought back is because the advice you gave was put to use, so they want more of it. Oftentimes, you know, if you go give a speech and they're like, we gave you a standing ovation and the survey says 10, they've already had you. And uh, that's not a way to build the business. So when I started this 20 years ago, I've done over 750 of these uh, since my career. 
over half of them have been, you know, brought bringbacks. And so I am totally laser focused on the feedback around application. That's why the prep calls are so important. That's why I give the client a bullet point of every prescription I'm going to make from the platform in case they say, don't make that one for whatever reason, or you're missing one from a call. When you bake it like that, the cake comes back really delicious, especially if you're trying to think about like, what's the value for the customer when they spend that money on a speaker? Are they trying to put butts in seats? That's not my category. There's celebrities that can go do that. I'm in the world of, can I invest in a meeting and help it change our world and our bottom line? I want to be in that business. I want to be that kind of speaker for people. This is fantastic because you know there is a lot of pressure on the people that make speaker recommendations and the people that make the choices. And I think it's music to anyone's ears to bring a speaker in and have the feedback be, we heard it, we used it, and we got results. So that, my friend, is our takeaway from today. And I'm so excited. I love that you are always reinventing yourself. And I'm so glad I ran into you in the grocery store. And uh, let's do- Miss Kismet. It was Kismet. Let's do 33 more. Let's do 33 more. Because guess what? <laughs> AI is not going away. In fact, I think it will become even more and more impactful over the course of the next few years. Or as Ethan Mollick likes to say, folks, this is the worst AI is ever going to be. Thank you for joining us on Backstage Pass with Gail Davis. Tune in for more exclusive interviews and pro tips to elevate your events. Don't forget to subscribe and share your thoughts with us. We'll catch you next time behind the curtain on Backstage Pass.